Our Split in Space, written by Samantha Bozen. Interior Spaceship, Nighttime. Dylan and Steven, both 30-something-year-old astronauts, are standing in the middle of the ship, in the middle of space, fighting. They're right in the middle of an argument when the scene begins and the tension is growing. Jesus fucking Christ, Steven. It's not like I meant to fall in love with you. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't plan this. Not like this. God. I mean, you know, if someone would have told me two years ago that I would have been stuck in a metal tube with my ex, I mean, I would have... Dylan, just... please, stop. No, let me fucking say what I need to say. They, 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 they just train us to come up here. It's, it's relentless, but I just didn't prepare to be stuck up here with you. Not, not like this. No, I'm sorry. You're sorry, huh? Yeah, yeah. Look, I know it's not ideal right now. But not ideal? <laughs> okay, so now you're the one interrupting me. Can I just finish, please? Yeah. I'm sorry. I know it's not ideal. It it sucks. You know, I mean, we're in fucking space. It's nuts. So, what do you think we do now? I don't know. Maybe for now, at least, we could just take some space. Ha ha. Very funny. I'm not trying to be funny. Well, because we're... We're stuck in space, literally. Right. Yeah. I mean, I know what you thought, but that's that's not what... I, what I'm trying to say is maybe we should just have a bit of distance for now. Well, we can, you know, process everything. That's not really practical. I mean, again, we're stuck in a fucking metal tube, so... Right. Um, but... What if, you know... You take this side and I'll take that side. Great. So now an already ridiculously small spaceship is having size so you can process your feelings. Woo! Look, Dylan, it's not what I want either, okay? I'm just as unenthused about being stuck up here as you are, but I was just trying to be freaking nice and give you some time to process the fact that I don't love you anymore. Jesus Christ, man. God. You didn't have to be so harsh. I get it. Dylan, I, I'm Don't really sorry. I didn't, fine, really. I didn't mean to hurt you. I, like you mean, I said it was fine. So, um, like you said, I'll take this side and you could just take that side. Just one thing. I know it's not ideal right now. That's what I was trying to say before. It sucks. And I really am just as heartbroken as you because I wanted this to work more than anything. I really care about you and I, I know you're hurting. And I'm sorry for hurting you. I just hope we can move past this. And, you know, learn to function as a team again. As friends even, at least as colleagues. Only 378 more days until I can get off this fucking spaceship. Okay, I get it. No, no, you, you don't. Look, like you said, you don't love me anymore. But I love you, Steven. That really fucking sucks. And all I want to do is just, just be down there with those tiny obnoxious, ridiculous, horrible people. <laughs> Just sing Adele at the top of my lungs at a karaoke bar. Just eat my feelings away and watching a rom-com. I mean, I mean, anything to feel something other than this. I just need some space. Like you said, you know, just all jokes aside, I need some space. God, I've never been more jealous of those people down there. They just 
live their lives. Endless potential of where they'll be, who they'll become. Yet they look up to us, astronauts. How fucking depressing is that? We're just floating up here in space, hitting a few buttons and collecting endless data. And our lives are shit compared to all of them down there. That's not true. I mean, you worked your ass off to get here. I mean, NASA, come on. How cool is that? Think of how many little kids down there on Earth look up at the sky at night and dream of being just like you, an astronaut. It's freaking amazing. You're amazing. Steven, don't. Dylan, I, I do love you. I just, I agree. I mean, being up here is exhausting and more isolating than I can ever begin to imagine. I, I feel like stuck. I mean, obviously, because we're literally stuck in space in this tiny tube, as you say, but I mean, like stuck mentally. I don't know. Maybe we, I just, I don't know. What? Maybe, maybe we'd what? I don't know. I guess maybe we work better down there. Where there's room to grow. Endless potential, as you say. I just feel stagnant. And like really disconnected from you up here. You know? I mean, you'd think being in space for several years with your partner would make you feel closer. But I honestly just feel really distant from you these days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, God, I'd be lying to myself if I said I feel like we've grown as a couple since being up here. Maybe dating was a bad idea. I don't know. I mean, most companies do frown upon office romances. <laughs> okay, th I think it's good. Us just splitting up. You do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least for now, I think I have a lot to think about for the next 378 days. And then what? What, what do you mean? Like, what happens when we get back to Earth? I, I don't know yet. Steven sighs. Dylan smiles empathetically at Steven and then turns around to his section of the spacecraft. Steven takes a longing deep breath and then turns around to his side too. The astronauts work on machines. Right now, they are together physically, but emotionally, they're worlds apart. A moment. Fade to black. Sarah, written by Jada Gordon. I found your obituary under dusty lock and key of other papers I don't need anymore. The people you look to for love were captives in chains. The strength you cried for, lost in the maze of the woods. Your voice amongst a world of black trauma, never acknowledged. I wonder how you fell free and what did you do at that moment? What's behind your grimace in the black and white picture? taken beneath the southern sun. Did you love your husband? If so, why? With 40 years age difference, what made you both connect? Did he die on top of you? The man you looked to for love was bound to the Bible, which chained him to a pulpit. The screams of nine children stretching your figure like putty inside to outside. When did your hands belong to yourself? Did you find yourself? Did you? Did you walk through fields and enjoy it? Have you ever fed a flower with your salty tears? Run barefoot down a dirt road and want to keep going? Crying the tiny souls tethered to your young womb and your husband's hand longing for your throat. Have you ever thought of a girl who would grow to look like you? A great grand young woman who would long for your story. Tell me why you stroke my hair in a rocking chair.
A Witchy Way, Part 1, written by Tangela Lee. Act 1, Scene 1. Lights up to Lamantha sitting at her kitchen table looking a mess. She's in her bonnet and PJs and she's smoking the last cigarette in the pack. She finishes the cigarette and reaches for another, forgetting that she just smoked her last, and grunts frustratedly before throwing the empty pack across the room. She's Damn. visibly defeated. I don't believe I let him get me down like this. Lamantha looks up to the sound of keys jingling in the door, then looks back down because she already knows who it is. Patrice walks through the door and sets down a brown bag of groceries on the counter. Oh, Lord. I don't have time for your foolishness today, P. Well, you better make time. What are you doing? Sulking. Well, stop. Patrice waves her hand and the food starts gracefully putting itself away, magically. Well, I just knew you'd be in here like this, still lamenting over the past and unwilling to move on. How long are you going to be down and out like this? I don't know, Patrice. Maybe forever? Well, I don't have time to wait for forever. I need my sister back and I need her now. I don't know what you suppose I'd do with carve my heart out and clean it with pine soil. Do you want me to... Go to the wizard like the dead man. <laughs> and then ask for a new one, baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm still hurting. And I am sympathetic. Trust me, I am. But, sweetie, this has gone on for far too long. He left, P. Just out of the blue. I understand that. Patrice yeah. moves to grab two coffee mugs from the cupboard. He didn't just take my heart with him, P. He took my dog and my checkbook, too. I'm not just sad for me. I was betrayed and basically robbed. Patrice begins mixing the tea and hands one mug to her sister. And I understand that too, but it was six months ago. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you one thing for certain and two things for sure. I have been here for the last six months right with you. I have sat through all of it with you. I even offered you help, magical help, the kind I promised Nana I would never do. I can't believe I'm only telling you this now, but it's time to move on. Or at the least, very least, get up and take a shower. Patrice stands back up and moves toward the kitchen cabinets again. You look like I haven't taken a shower in six months. Oh, it smells like you have. Hush. <laughs> you know, Pete. You know I, how I felt all these years about that man. How much I sacrificed for him. How much I put on the bank burner. How much I gave up for him. Just for our kids to get grown and for him to toss me and our love aside like yesterday's paper. I felt blindsided, P. Not just blindsided. I felt displaced and used and discarded like trash. I'm the mother of his children and his wife. And he just threw me away after 20 years. 20 years of devotion and adoration. I told that man. Oh, sweetie, I know, I know. You don't know. You don't know because you couldn't know. You never loved anything but money and magic. And all the things that money and magic could get you. The kind of love that he and I shared, it was, it was different. It wasn't materialistic. Yeah, well, it was one-sided. What? You heard me. You've been over here droning on and on for the last six months over that ass hat of a man and your love. The love he so carelessly tossed aside. Mm -hmm. So obviously it wasn't that great. And you know something else? Patrice moves to leave, using her magic to hoist her purse up and a carton of milk she brought. But then she turns back. Money and magic never left me. They never took themselves, my dog, and my self-worth to leave me pitiful and alone with nothing but regret, an ungrateful attitude, and a half a worth year's worth of stench. Oh, believe me, there's still time.
I'm going to leave you before you say something else you'll regret. I'll come back tomorrow, and hopefully you'll have a sunnier disposition. Don't bother. Patrice leaves, slamming the door behind her. Lamantha sits in silence, staring after the door and locking it with her own magic before continuing her lamenting. Fade to black. Act 1, Scene 2. Lamantha's Living Room. Lamantha sits on the couch in a different headscarf from the day before, indicating that she took her sister's advice and took a shower. A South Korean drama plays on the TV, and a loud South Korean ballad plays over images of a couple breaking up. Lamantha wipes her tears from a tissue and startles as a knock sounds at the front door. The door opens to Patrice, holding up her hand as if she's opened it with her powers. Lamantha's eyes never move from the TV, but her expression is increasingly more angry. Patrice looks her over before heading to the kitchen. We hear shuffling around, but we don't see her. Is your attitude somewhat better today? Lamantha remains silent, staring at the TV still, playing her show. Patrice comes back through the kitchen door with a bowl of soup and the spoon spinning on its own. I'll take that as a no. Here, eat this. Patrice moves to hand Lamantha the bowl, but Lamantha jerks her arm towards herself childishly. What are you doing? Are you seriously going to behave this childishly over what I said yesterday? Mm-hmm. Will you just eat this soup? Patrice shoves the bowl in her face again to no avail. They engage in a push and pull type of situation. Lamantha stands to her feet. No! Take it! No! I said take it! Come on! Take it! Take no. it! Patrice shoves the bowl in her direction one more time while Lamantha pushes it harshly the opposite way. It spills all over Patrice. Oh. Oh. <sighs> God, you've always been wasteful. That was the only Tuscan sound root I had left. (laughs) Well, maybe you... Wait a minute. Tuscan root. Now, why the hell would Tuscan root be in soup? Well, you know, because... uh, Because what? I, I had an idea. Uh-huh. What kind of idea? Oh, one that would help you. Yeah. Uh, what? Stop beating around the bush and tell me what you were planning. I was, well, what I wanted. Patrice panics, scoops what's not soaked in off of her shirt, and shoves her finger into Lamantha's mouth. Lamantha swallows loudly with a shocked expression. I can't believe you just did that. What? Lamantha dramatically faints. It was for your own good. Patrice grabs at her sister, trying to position her in a more comfortable way. Then she grabs a napkin from the coffee table and tries to clean herself off to no avail. She throws her hands up and leaves the room. Fade to black. Lights come up and we see Patrice on the armchair with her head in one hand and a book in the other. Lamantha sits with her arms crossed, but her head is completely laid back. Her mouth is also wide open. Patrice gets a little too into her book and starts talking. Is there not one woman on this God's green earth that isn't letting some man ruin her life? Lamantha starts to stir and groans, startling Patrice, and she gets up to rush to her side. Patrice whispers, slapping at Lamantha's arm. Lamantha? Lamantha Manny? Manny? Lamantha stirs a little more and starts to wake up. She looks down at her crossed hands, confused, and shakes them loose. What the hell did you do? Oh, nothing you won't thank me for later. Patrice smacks her on the arm and walks back over to her seat. I got a little worried there. You've been out for a couple of hours. I was starting to think I've given you too much. Wait, too much? Oh, so you really were trying to kill me? Oh, now why would you say that? What the, because a finger's worth of that. Knock me on my ass. 
You a bad old freaking fool fool. Oh, please. I was banking on you knocking out right after the first fight, and I was right. I still want to know what you... What? 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 <sighs> Lamantha gets up and shakes her body around. Woo! <laughs> oh my goodness. It's gone. What's gone? The heaviness in my chest. Oh. It was this ache and it was right here. <laughs> oh my, it's like a big tin bucket of nine inch nails, but it's gone. And how do you feel about that? Well, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, it's been a part of me for so long and I just learned to live with it. But I, I can breathe again. <laughs> oh. oh, yes. <laughs> I've gotten a deep breath in. I've gotten that in months. <laughs> I don't know what you did, but thank you. Lamantha grabs Patrice and hugs her a little too tight. Okay, okay, okay. That's enough. You're not going in the rut. It's thanks enough for me. No need to squeeze the life out of me. Stop. Stop it. Quit it. No, oh, well. <laughs> You know what? I just don't know what to do with all this newfound freedom. How about getting a shower and going out to dinner, my treat? Oh, I absolutely want to do that. Nice. Did you hear me? Did you hear what I just said? Yes, I heard you. I want to do it. <laughs> I actually want to leave the house. Finally. <sighs> this is obviously nothing short of of magic. <laughs> well, what can I say? I say. <laughs> a pair of keys can be heard jingling in the door. A young woman walks in quickly with her nose in her phone and a slight attitude. Mom, can I have the 40 bucks you promised me for the movie tonight? <laughs> oh, hey, Auntie. Hey, baby. Hey. Mom, the money. Um, I'm sorry. Who are you, Sisha? What? That's your youngest daughter. Quit playing, girl. I'm not playing. I don't remember her. Oh, um, my goodness. You did not. Lamantha turns toward her sister, already understanding what's going on. Oh. You used a forget me spell, didn't you? I did. Oh my. Lights fade to black. Don't 